Chapter 7, A Day with the Beavers. While the two boys were whispering behind, both the girls suddenly cried, oh, and stopped. The robin, cried Lucy. The robin, it's flown away. And so it had, right out of sight. And now what are we going to do, said Edmund, giving Peter a look, which as much as to say, what did I tell you? Shh, look, said Susan. What, said Peter. There's something moving among the trees, over there to the left. They all stared as hard as they could, and no one felt very comfortable. There it goes again, said Susan presently. I saw it that time too, said Peter. Peter, It's still there. It's just gone behind that big tree. What is it? asked Lucy, trying very hard not to sound nervous. Whatever it is, said Peter, it's dodging us. It's something that doesn't want to be seen. Let's go home, said Susan. And then, though nobody said it out loud, everyone suddenly realized the same fact that Edmund had whispered to Peter at the end of the last chapter. They were lost. What's it like, said Lucy. It's, it's a kind of animal, said Susan. And then, look, look, quick, there it is. They all saw it this time a whiskered, furry face, which had looked out at them from behind a tree. But this time, it didn't immediately draw back. Instead, the animal put its paw against its mouth, just as humans put their fingers on their lips when signaling you to be quiet. Then it disappeared again. The children all stood, holding their breaths. A moment later, the stranger came out from behind the tree, glanced all around as if it were afraid someone was watching, and said, Hush! and made signs for them to join it in the thicket of the wood where it was standing, and then once more disappeared. I know what it is, said Beaver. It's a beaver. I know what it is, said Peter. It's a beaver. I saw its tail. It wants us to go to it, said Susan, and it's warning us not to make any noise. I know, said Peter. The question is, are we going to go to it or not? What do you think, Lou? I think it's a nice beaver, said Lucy. Yes, but how do we know, said Edmund. Shan't we have to risk it? Asked Susan. I mean, it's no good just standing here, and I feel I want some dinner. At this moment, the beaver again popped its head out from behind the tree and beckoned earnestly to them. Come on, said Peter. Let's give it a try. I'll keep close together. We ought to be a match for one beaver if it turns out to be an enemy. So the children all got close together and walked up to the tree and in behind it. And sure enough, they found the beaver, but it still drew back, saying that to them in a hoarse, throaty whisper, further in, come further in. We're not right in here. We're not safe out in the open. Only when it had led them into a dark spot where four trees grew so close together that their boughs met and the brown earth and pine needles could be seen underfoot because no snow had fallen there. Did it begin to talk to them? Are you the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? It said. We're some of them, said Peter. Shh, said Beaver. Not so loud, please. We're not safe, even here. Why, what are you afraid of, said Peter? There's no one here but ourselves. There are the trees, said the beaver. They're always listening. But there are, most of them are on our side, but there are trees that would betray us to her. You know who I mean. And it nodded its head several times. If it comes to talking about sides, said Edmund, how do we know you are a friend? Not meaning to be rude, Mr. Beaver, said Peter, but you see we're strangers. Quite right, quite right, said the beaver. Here is my token. With those words, it held up to them a little white object. They all looked at it in surprise till Lucy said suddenly, Oh, of course, it's my handkerchief, the one I gave to poor Mr. Tumnus. That's right, said the beaver. Poor fellow. He got wind of the arrest before it actually happened and handed this over to me. He said that if anything happened to you, I should meet you and take you on to... Here the beaver's voice sank into silence, and it gave one or two very mysterious nods. Then signaling to the ch children to stand as close as they could as possible so their faces were actually tickled by its whiskers, it added in a low whisper. 
They say Aslan is on the move, perhaps has already landed. And now a very curious thing happened. None of the children had any idea who Aslan was any more than you do right now. But the moment the beaver had spoken these words, everyone felt quite different. Perhaps, oh, felt quite different. Perhaps as sometimes happened to you in a dream that someone says something you don't quite understand but in the dream, it feels as though it has enormous meaning. Either a terrifying one, which turns the whole dream into a nightmare, or else a lovely meaning, too lovely to put into words, which makes the dream so beautiful that you remember it all your life and are always wishing you could get back into the dream again. It was like that now. At the name of Aslan, each of the children felt something jump in its, in its insides. Edmund felt a sensation of mysterious horror. Peter felt suddenly brave and adventurous. Susan felt as if some delicious smell or some delightful strain of music had just floated by her. And Lucy, Lucy got the feeling you have when you wake up in the morning and realize it's the beginning of the holidays or the beginning of summer. And what about Mr. Tumnus, said Lucy? Where is he? Shh, said the beaver, not here. I must bring you where we have, have a real talk and also have some dinner. No one except Edmund felt any difficulty trusting the beaver now. And everyone, including Edmund, was very glad to hear the word dinner. They therefore all hurried along behind their new friend who led them at a surprisingly quick pace and always in the thickest parts of the forest for over an hour. Everyone was feeling very tired and very hungry when suddenly the trees began to get thinner in front of them and the ground to fall steeply downhill. A minute later, they came out into the open sky, the sun was still shining, and found themselves looking down into a fine sight. They were standing on the edge of a steep, narrow valley at the bottom of which ran, at least would have been running if it hadn't been frozen, a fairly large river. Just below them, a dam had been built across the river, this river. And when they saw it, Everyone suddenly remembered that, of course, beavers are always making dams and felt quite sure that Mr. Beaver had made this one. They also noticed that now he had sort of a modest expression on his face, the sort of look people have when, they are, when you are visiting a garden they've made or reading a story they've written. So it was only common politeness when Susan said, what a lovely dam. And Mr. Beaver didn't say hush this time, but said, merely a trifle, merely a trifle and it wasn't really finished. Above the dam, there was what ought to have been a deep pool, but now, of course, a level floor of dark, dark green ice, and below the dam, much lower down, was more ice, but instead of being smooth, this was all frozen into foamy and wavy shapes in which the water had been rushing along at the very moment when the frost came. And where the water had been trickling over and spurting through the dam, there, were now glittering, there was now a gl glittering wall of icicles, as if the side of the dam had been covered all with flowers and wreaths and festoons of the purest sugar. And out in the middle and partly on top of the dam was a funny little house shaped rather like an enormous beehive. And from a hole in the roof, you could see smoke was going up so that when you saw it, especially if you were hungry, you at once thought of cooking and became hungrier than you were before. That was something the others chiefly noticed, but Edmund noticed something else. A little lower down the river, there was another small river, which had come down another valley to join it. And looking up at that valley, Edmund could see two small hills, and he was almost sure they were the two hills which the white witch had pointed out to him when he parted from her at the lamp post the other day. And then between them, he thought, must be her palace, only a mile off or less. And he thought about Turkish delight and being a king, and I wonder how Peter will like that, he asked himself. And horrible ideas came into his head. Here we are, said Mr. Beaver. It looks as if Mrs. Beaver is expecting us. I'll lead the way, but be careful and don't slip. The top of the dam was wide enough to walk on, though not for humans a very nice place to walk, because it was covered with ice. And though the frozen pool was level with it on one side, there was a nasty drop to the lower river on the other. Along this route, Mr. Beaver led them single file right into the middle 
where they could look a long way up the river and a long way down it. And when they had reached the middle, the middle, they were at the door of the house. Here we are, Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. I've found them. Here are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And they all went in. The first thing Lucy noticed as she went in was a roaring sound. And the first thing she saw was a kind-looking old she-beaver sitting in the corner with thread in her mouth, working busily at her sewing machine. And it was from the sound that it was from it that the sound came. She stopped her work and got up as soon as the children came in. So you've come at last, she said, holding out both her wrinkled paws. At last, to think I should ever live to see this day. The potatoes are boiling and the kettle singing, and I dare say, Mr. Beaver, you'll get us some fish. That I will, said Mr. Beaver, and he went out of the house, Peter with him. They went across the ice of the deep pool where he had a little hole in the ice, which he kept open with his, every day with his hatchet. They took a pail with them. Mr. Beaver sat down quietly in the middle of the hole, at the edge of the hole. He didn't seem to mind it being so cold, looking hard into it. Then suddenly shot, his, shot in his paw, and before he could say Jack Robinson, had whisked out a beautiful trout. He did it over and over until they had a fine catch. Meanwhile, the girls were helping Mrs. Beaver fill the kettle and lay out the table and cut the bread and put out the plates and, hu and draw a huge jug of beer for Mr. Beaver from a barrel which stood in one corner of the house and to put on the frying pan and get the drippings hot. Lucy thought the beavers had a snug little home, though it was not at all like Mrs. Thomas's cave, Mr. Thomas's cave. There were no books or pictures, and instead of beds, there were bunks like on a board ship built into the wall. There were hams and strings of onion hanging from the roof, and against the wall were gum boots and oilskins and hatchets and a pair of shears and spades and trowels and all the things for carrying on mortar for carrying mortar in, and fishing rods and fishing nets and sacks. The cloth, though very clean, that was on the table was rough. Just as the frying pan was nicely hissing, Peter and Beaver came, Peter and Mr. Beaver came in with the fish which Mr. Beaver had already cleaned out in the open air. Now we're ready, said Mrs. Beaver, said Mr. Beaver. Susan drained the potatoes and then put them all back in the empty pot to dry on the side of the range while Lucy was helping Mr. Mrs. Beaver dish up the trout so that in a few minutes everyone was drawing up their stools. It was all three-legged stools in the Beaver's house and preparing to enjoy themselves. There was a jug of creamy milk for the children and, and beer for Mr. Beaver and a great big lump of deep yellow butter in the middle of the table from which everyone took as much as he wanted to go with his potatoes. And all the children thought, and I agree with them, that there's nothing to beat good freshwater fish if you got it, if you eat it when it has been alive only a half hour before and has come into the minute half a minute before. And when they had finished the fish that Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven, and when they had finished the fish, Mrs. Beaver brought unexpectedly out of the oven a great and glorious sticky marmalade roll, steaming hot so that so at the same time they moved the kettle onto the fire, so that when they had finished the marmalade roll, the tea was made and ready to be poured. And when each person got his or her cup of tea, and each person shoved back his or her stool to be able to lean against the wall and gave a long sigh of contentment, Mr. Beaver said, and now, if you'll just wait until I've got my pipe lit and going nicely, why we can get down to business. Oh, it's snowing again, he added. That's all the better, he said, because it means we shan't have any visitors, and if anyone should have been trying to track to follow you, he won't find any tracks. <laughs>